Good evening again. Please turn with me to Proverbs. We're going to start in chapter 3. But as we did last week, you're going to want to let your fingers do the walking. Grayson, my friend, in the office, on the table, is a two-sided stack of papers with tonight's verses. Could you see if you could find those? Because I brilliantly forgot them. Four or five times over the last 15 years, I've done a school of ministry, two or three year cohort with people whose hearts were for pastoral ministry specifically. Not all young people. Um, in 2008 in particular, uh, we had a cohort of folks who were mostly my age convinced that with the Obama administration, the persecution of the church would begin shortly, wanting to be equipped to pastor underground churches. Grayson is going to pass out uh, a one-pager. Actually, it's a two-pager. It's double-sided with the verses for tonight. Um, at the end of the evening, you can let me know if you find that helpful. This was suggested by a couple folks last week as uh, maybe a, a helpful tool to have a place to take notes. I like to take notes in my Bible. Maybe you do, maybe you don't. We'll see if it's helpful. If it is, we'll figure out a way to keep this going. This is a pilot. But anyway, so School of Ministry, one of the things that I typically do when I'm leading people through a two or three year course of equipping for pastoral ministry is a class in systematic theology. Systematic theology is just what it sounds like. It's a consolidation of all of the doctrines of the Bible, doctrine by doctrine. And there are one volume basic systematic theologies. There are three or four volume more elaborate ones. Here's everything that the Bible says about the Holy Spirit. Here's everything the Bible says about the attributes of God. Here's everything that the Bible says about creation and so on. I've done it, like I said, four or five, maybe six times. And every time I've done it, there's at least one person in the class whose mind explodes and who finds the whole idea unacceptable, inconceivable. This is Calvary. This is not how we study God's Word. We study God's Word verse by verse. We study God's Word the way that He wrote it. Not all rearranged and stuff. And that's true. It's not how God wrote it. And it's not how we at Calvary usually study the things of God. It doesn't mean that rearranging it and studying, and studying theology systematically isn't worthwhile. Taking, okay, what do we know about the Holy Spirit, the person of the Holy Spirit, the attributes of the Holy Spirit, the ministries of the Holy Spirit? I mean, does anyone think it's a bad idea to, to consider in one field of view everything we know about these, these, these huge and important topics? Now, that's not to say that we shouldn't also, in, in, or primarily, read the Bible the way it's written, because God wrote it the way that it's written, and he did it for reasons. Some we can, we can probably glean, some I'm sure that are our pastor understanding. You know, one of the, the beautiful things about the Bible is even if we take one portion out, grab any book of the Bible, you can find the gospel in it. In Genesis, by, before we get, by, by the time we get to chapter 3, God's plan for redemption. Exodus, we see God's picture of redemption. Leviticus, we see the Redeemer pictured how many different ways in feasts and sacrifices and in the tabernacle. Kings, David as a type of Jesus, Romans, Isaiah, a Bible in miniature. It's a good exercise. Go through every book with the Bible. And if that's the only book that you had, how would you show somebody the gospel? How would you show somebody Jesus? God distributes the beauty and the, and the majesty of his plan for redemption throughout an entire book, and he tells the story how many different ways. Why else does God write the book the way that he does? Another reason is that it makes the Bible self-validating. Because rather than 
one book, really what we have is a collection of 66 books written by 40 different people over hundreds if not thousands of years that contains zero contradictions. Written across three continents and three languages. One integrated message system. Perfectly expressing God's redemptive love in a way that's demonstrably not of human authorship. So there's a lot of ways that God a lot of reasons why God writes the Bible the way that he does. Even so, it can be useful to say, now that we have the entirety of God's word, what's everything we know about this subject or this topic or this person? And I was thinking about that because obviously it's not all that different than the way that we're approaching our study of Proverbs. And I don't want you to infer what I don't mean to imply. Studying the, the book of Proverbs topically is not to say God did it wrong. God was messed up the way that he wrote it. He made a mistake. There was a better way. No, not at all. I think the way that Proverbs is laid out is genius. Beyond genius for many reasons. Not the least of which is there's 31 of them. You can read a proverb a day every day of the month. And every day get a cross section of God's wisdom because no one proverb deals, ex I'm sorry, no one chapter of Proverbs deals exclusively with one topic. Some focus primarily on one. But in any given day, if you read a chapter of Proverbs a day, you're going to get a cross-section of, of God's wisdom. And if you've tried doing that, you know how often that, that chapter just happens to speak to something that the Lord knows is waiting later that day. I don't think it's the only reason that God laid it out that way. I think a lot of it just has to do with the way that Solomon wrote it and how others recorded it. But it's not bad by any means. But just like sometimes it's useful to study systematic theology, what's everything that the Bible says about the end times from Revelation and from the prophetic books and from the Olivet Discourse, sometimes it's interesting to study Proverbs systematically. What's everything that Solomon has to say about money? That was last week. What's everything that he has to say about wealth and poverty and generosity? That's going to be our focus this week. And especially since so many, I don't know how many, but I know that many of you are in the habit in your daily Bible reading of reading a proverb a day. October 1st, read Proverbs chapter 1. October 5th, read Proverbs chapter 5. It's a different way to share the same information then. Organizing it differently. Some things that you've read a dozen times more than that might strike you differently. That's a good thing. It's always good. It's always fun. It's always rewarding to see something in Scripture that you've read before but never seen before. All of which really is just introduction to tonight's study. But I had a couple people ask, why are we doing it this way? Reasonable question. I thought it deserved a thoughtful answer. But let's talk about pigs. Man gets saved. And he is so overflowing with excitement about being saved. And he wants everybody to know how excited he is about being saved. He jumps up in the middle of service and said, God is so good. I'll tell you how, God, how good God is. If I had 50 pigs, I'd give God 25 of them. And the pastor says, wow, that's, I mean, that's impressive. But let me ask you if, you, if you had 30 pigs, would you give God 15 of them? Well, sure. So that must mean if you had 10 pigs, you'd give God five of them. <laughs> you bet. So if you had two pigs, you'd give God one of them. And the man says, well, just hang on a minute, preacher. You know I only have two pigs. That's all of us, isn't it? I'm not saying it's what we would say. I'm not saying it's the decision we'd make. Some of you are saying, I, I would never own pigs. <laughs> Sheep are worse. But it's a battle we all face between our sin nature, which is selfish, and our saved souls, which are seeking to become Christ-like. It's the battle that we have between flesh and spirit. It's the battle that we have between the pull of sin, the allure of sin, and the draw of sanctification. The battlefield is our heart. And it rages on. 
And one of the things that our flesh is great at, one of the things that our sin nature is brilliant at, is rationalization. Coming up with spiritual sounding excuses for being carnal. Am I right? That's why it can be helpful to let God confront us with his perspective on some things. So let's read some Bible. I said Proverbs 3, didn't I? Let's start in verse 27. Do not withhold good from those to whom it is due when it's in the power of your hand to do so. Do not withhold good from those to whom it is due. Literally what it's saying is don't withhold good from the people it belongs to. We're starting off talking about giving. Remember the the topic for tonight is generosity, giving. And we're starting off with giving that's contractually obligated. I'll give you X if you perform Y service for me. And what Solomon, the, the scenario that he's raising is, well, what if somebody did Y service and, and, and you don't give them X that you promised to? There's a lot of ways to do that. You just say, <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm just not going to pay you. Or you can say, well, you didn't do it to my satisfaction. I really meant like this. I intended that. What are you going to do? Sue me? I worked for a company when I was, when I was young that... that Really, that was their their character in every direction. They would promise the moon, the sun, and the stars to people as they hired them. And when none of that materialized, when the benefits weren't what they were promised, when the pay scale wasn't what was what was anticipated, the answer was if you don't like it, quit. They did the same thing though to their bank. The bank said, Well, you promised to make certain payments, uh, you know, at certain times and on a pretty regular basis, they'd say, we're not going to pay this month, and, and if you don't like us, you can sue us, but we'll just declare bankruptcy, and then you'll get nothing. People do business like that. There's a lot of ways to, to move the goalpost. And, and, and you know, rather than come up, you know, rather than talk about 30, 11 other ways of doing it, you've all encountered it, Right. You thought you had a deal and someone changed the rules. You didn't get what what had been agreed to. Whatever the fact pattern, it's wrong. Because as soon as the service was performed, as soon as the, the, the goods were delivered, at that point what was promised belongs to you. It's also wrong, verse 28, to delay paying people. Well, I'll pay them eventually. No, verse 28, do not say to your neighbor, go and come back and tomorrow I'll give it when you have it with you. I was in this situation as a business owner. One of my customers that was 40% of our business at that time, all of a sudden said, you know what? We've been paying you 30 days. You know, you send us a bill and we'll pay you within 30 days. That's, that's you know, normal and customary in business. But unilaterally, without notice, without negotiation, yeah, we're going to start paying you 90 days. You're going to wait three months for your money. When our contractors, who, who were our friends, mine and Ann's, they couldn't afford to wait 90 days, and we'd promise them that they wouldn't have to wait 90 days. Come to find out this was a corporate policy. That it wasn't a coincidence that small businesses like ours were, were doing business with this giant multinational corporation. That was a corporate strategy to do business with small vendors and then change the terms knowing that we couldn't walk away from 40% of our business. We'd have to find a way to swallow it. That was strategy on their part. Greed. The thing is, though, And what we just read applies to us. Because there's times that we do it as well. Rent is due. The plumber did the work. We owe some money to a relative. The doctor bill shows up. And we rationalize. I'll pay them next month. They can afford to wait. I'll pay them half now and half later because they can they can afford it. They're charging too much anyway. You know what? I'm just not going to pay it. What are they going to do? What does God say? He just told us in 
is wrong. Not keeping our word is wrong. Stealing from someone who already has ownership of what was promised is wrong. It's a horrible witness. Sometimes they don't have the money. That's true. Life happens. What do we do when that happens? We have the conversation. What do you do when you're, when you're faced with two bad choices? Hunker down, hope nobody notices. <laughs> Pretend everything's okay. Deny everything. No, man keeps his word even to his detriment. Hey, I can't do the thing I said I was going to do. Own it. Own it. If you can't say amen, at least say ouch. <laughs> we could probably camp out here all evening, but I want to go home tonight. So let's go to chapter 11. Because we're just getting started. Chapter 11, we'll go to verse 24. There's one who scatters, yet increases more, and there's one who withholds more than is right, but it leads to poverty. God just articulated the principle behind the example that we looked at back in chapter 3. We're faced with this choice probably every day. Certainly a dozen times or more a month. The choice between trying to keep, trying to not lose, trying to protect, or releasing it to the Lord. And we could pull a lot of different scenarios from the, the verses we just read. Go on to the next verse. The generous soul will be made rich, and he who waters will also be watered himself. The people will curse him who withholds grain, but blessing will be on the head of him who sells it. There's a lot of different forms and, and permutations. We can, we can pay fair or we can pay poverty wages. We can hoard in the hopes of driving up prices, knowing that people will get hurt in the process. Or we can release those, those, those resources to the marketplace. The different scenarios, the ones that are listed in Proverbs and others that we could think of, they all come down to that binary. Are we trying to keep or are we trying to release? Are we willing to release? What's behind that choice? It's what we talked about last week. Who do we think the money belongs to? Are we dealing with something that is ours? Or are we acting as a steward for the Lord? Because really when we face a choice to close our hands or open our hands, the question we should be asking ourselves is, what would God have me do right now? Or even what would God do right now? And sometimes the Lord says, wait. Sometimes the Lord says, hold. Sometimes the Lord says, not yet. But is that the reason we do the things we do? When our temptation is to hoard, to hunker down, to pull in, are we doing it because the Lord has told us to? Or are we doing it out of fear? We're afraid of what happens if we don't. Are we asking the Lord the question? I'm going to say mostly. Mostly. This is one of those times where we say, I don't know the Lord's will. Because we're afraid to ask. We're afraid because we might not like the answer. If we ask and we still don't know the answer, here's my suggestion. Based on what we just read. Err on the side of what? Others. Why? Because if it's God's money and I don't know what else to do, I should make the decision that accords with the character of God. If God hasn't spoken clearly, this is what I want you to do? If I don't know for sure, do the thing that accords with the character of God and not with fear. Fear is not of the Lord. And what is the character of God? God gives, doesn't he? God releases. God provides. God gives life. God gives salvation. God gives the Holy Spirit. God gives eternity. God shares the riches of his inheritance. Jesus does. 
Do you trust that that's who God is? Are you willing to align yourself with God who gives? That's a real question. Because this is the point where some people say, I don't see God that way. I don't, I hear what you're saying, but I don't believe that's who God is. Because God took from me. God robbed from me. God hurt me. And and if that's where you are, I I say this with, with no condemnation, there's no reproach. If that's where you are, that's what you need to work out. Because nothing else I'm going to say about giving, nothing else from God's word about giving is going to make any sense. Because it's, it's built on a premise that you don't agree with. If you're not comfortable with the idea that God loves and provides and gives in abundance, then you need to stop there and say, okay, who God says he is in his word and how I've experienced and how I'm processing God are two different things and you got to work that out. And I'm going to encourage you, get a pastor, get a friend, get a leader, get someone that you trust to, to walk through that with you. Because otherwise you're going to be at war with God's word. And truly you're going to be at war with yourself. You're going to be at, at war with the God who lives in your heart. But assuming that you're okay with the idea that God is who he says he is, an abundant giver, then when in doubt, err on the side of giving, err on the side of releasing. Okay, I see that God gives, but that's still, I don't know. That's hard. Okay, here's the next sticking point. Here's the next sticking point. What do you also have to believe to be comfortable with giving rather than keeping. You have to let go of the idea that to help someone else is to deprive yourself. You have to walk away from the presupposition that it's a zero-sum game, that there's only a finite amount of wealth in the world and that if, if, if somebody else wins, that means that I lose. Is, is that actually true? I, I read, and I don't know if this is true, I was reading this week, somebody said that President Trump ascribes to the idea that each human being only has a certain number of heartbeats. It's, it's one of those ideas that, that floats around that your heart is created with a certain number of, of beats, and, and when it's beat that many times, it's, it's done. Which is why some people, and this is, this is, whether President Trump believes it or not, there are people who believe it, that's why they say don't exercise. Because elevating your heart rate, you're just going to die faster. (laughs) There's people who believe that. You know, you only have a certain number of heartbeats. When they're done, they're done. Well, listen, there are people who believe that about money. There's only a certain amount of value or wealth in the universe, and and all we can do is rearrange it. But who's God? Creator. Brings life from lifelessness. Brings the universe out of nothingness. Owns the cattle on a thousand hills. That's a poetic way of saying God is infinitely wealthy. Has resources that we can't dream of. And can't exhaust. Ignacy Paderewski was a Polish pianist and composer. And a leader in the Polish independence movement in the early 20th century. His leadership in the independence movement landed him a seat as prime minister by 1919. He was a a signatory of the Treaty of Versailles that ended World War I. There's a story that's told about him. When he was a poor college student studying in the United States, he and a friend looked at each other and said, we don't have the money to go to school next semester. We don't have tuition. We don't have books. We don't have room. we We can't do this. But they, 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 sorry, not Paderewski, two, two students contacted Paderewski and said, you need to help us. Would you do a benefit concert? 
and we'll pay you $2,000 to come to California to do this benefit concert. And, and their hope was that they would raise much more than that and with the, with the proceeds they'd be able to pay to go, go to school. Well, at the end of the concert, Paderewski came, he performed, it was brilliant, it was wonderful, but they'd only raised $1,600. And they said, well, that didn't work. <laughs> and, and embarrassed, chagrined, they, they said, look, this is all we came up with, it's less than we... We, we promised you, but it's all that we have, and, and we promise to get you the other $400 as soon as we can. Paderewski says, no, 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 <laughs> that won't do. No, that, that, we, we can't do that. How much is it going to cost for you to go to school? And they said, well, it's this much. He said, okay, so take out that much, add 10% for organizing this concert, give me whatever's left, which wasn't a lot. Years later, he's the prime minister of Poland, and it's post-war Europe. There's famine. People are starving, and he desperately needs to import food for his people. And he knows that there's only one person in the world who can help him. He reaches out to that person. That person gladly agrees, and he was so moved that he traveled to Paris to, to, to meet that person the next time that he, he knew that he was going to be in Europe. And he said to Herbert, Herbert Hoover, thank you, President Hoover, for arranging that, that huge shipment of grain for Poland. The Polish people are forever in your debt. And Herbert Hoover said, you did me a big favor when I was a college student. It was the least I could do. The law of reaping and sowing. When we give, when we trust, God has a way of returning a multiple of what we entrust to him. But see, trusting and reaping and sowing requires two things. It requires trusting God's ability to give, and it requires trusting in God's character, the delight that God takes in doing good. And it requires believing those things even when we don't immediately see it. Even when the sowing and the reaping take years to come full circle. Is, is, do we believe that that's our God? That he's willing and able? That he's good? Chapter 13, verse 22. A good man leaves an inheritance to his children's children, but the wealth of the sinner is stored up for the righteous. We talked about this when we were in Ecclesiastes, the strange economics of inheritance. And we read here and elsewhere, God blesses the righteous unto the second and third generation. But we all shoot up our hands, except when he doesn't. Because <laughs> I can tell you stories, man. <laughs> I can tell you stories about the rich getting richer and the poor getting poorer. Our flesh latches on to those stories because it seems to disqualify our trust in God. It seems to necessitate that look out for yourself because that whole God takes care of the righteous. Well, hang on. Are you willing to believe that God loves your children and your children's children more than you do? And again, this is where I say, if your answer is no, then this is where you stop because you're believing something that's contrary to God's word, and, and, and that's something that you genuinely want to work out. But if you nod and say, yeah, absolutely, God has, has infinite capacity to love, of course he loves my kids more than I do. Okay. Then are you willing to believe that if the inheritance you leave your children doesn't look like what you hoped, what you wish that it were, is God still passing on something of worth? An example, a testimony, a witness, faith. My father plunged headlong into sin late in his life and, and to, to the point where he ended up killing himself because he couldn't deal with the, the repercussions of the choices that he was making. And in the note that he left for my mom, he scolded her blamed her 
You never gave me credit for this investment. You never gave me credit for, for this business move. You never gave me credit for, for this financial decision. Trying to justify the, the, the sinful choices that he made. To gamble away the money that, that he had made. To, to, to start drinking again after years of sobriety. To leave my mother for another woman. Now, that's what sin does. It tries to rationalize. But I read it over and over and over. And I kept thinking to myself, did he really think that if he'd left us a million dollars, we would have preferred that to the relationship that was fractured, to the example that was squandered? What's more valuable, the a uh, the, uh, $500,000 estate or the, the, the children who, who, whose treasures are in the Lord? Why can't we have both? <laughs> yeah, both is great. But if in, in God's eyes the two are going to war with each other, if, if, if one is going to happen at the expense of the other, are we willing to release that? Are we willing to say, okay, God, you love my kids more than, than I do. And I'm trusting that, that what they're going to get as I follow you is more precious than silver and gold. Choose between the example of following the Lord and a big bank account. That's not a choice. So, so let's pause. Where are we at? It's about sharing and keeping this question, this, this, this subject of generosity. And God clearly calls us to share, to hold what we have with open hands, to be, get, be willing to release it for God's purposes to those we owe, to those we do business with, to our children, even in ways that we might not expect. Why? God's money to begin with. Trusting God with it is an opportunity for God to manifest his character. And it's an opportunity for us to, to show that we trust him. So with those principles established, let's move on to another category of generosity. One that God talks a lot about, which is generosity to the poor. Chapter 14. Verse 20. The poor man is hated even by his own neighbor, but the rich has many friends. He who despises his neighbor's sins, but he who has mercy on the poor, happy is he. I think happy here is the wrong word. I truly believe that the Holy Spirit intended joyful. Because there's something supernaturally delightful about giving. Giving without obligation or expectation. Releasing. Being generous to those in need might sound like I'm parsing words here and, and, and playing semantic games. I promise I'm not. Let me get there by analogy. We've talked, I think most of us in the past, about the distinction between volunteering and serving. Yeah? Volunteering. I'm going to show up at a place in time of my choosing to do the work that I desire versus serving. I'm going to show up where the need is to do the work that's necessary. Volunteering is about me. It's about what I want to get through my time. I might not get paid with money, but I'm expecting to get paid with recognition. Serving is about giving with no expectation of anything in return. So if you're tracking the distinction, there's a similar distinction we can make between the, 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 the giving that's about me, let's call it a donation, and the gift that's truly about others. How do you know the difference? Here's one way, not a perfect litmus test, but a pretty good one. Would you still do it if no one ever found out about it? Are you willing to trade all the possible worldly honor that could be attached to it for heavenly honor? Are you willing to trade happiness which is the domain of this world, for joy. Because giving, in the true sense of the word, other-centered giving, is joyful. When I bought my first house, I was a little short. There was back and forth, and, and I ended up a little short on the down payment. Call a friend of mine. I said, can I borrow $3,000? And he said, sure. I'd love to help you get a house. He loaned me $3,000. It was years later, more than five, less than 10 years later. 
I had the money to pay him back, plus interest, and I called him up, and I said, I've got the money, and, and I want to pay back, I want to pay back interest, I'm really grateful, and he said, you know what, give it to the Lord, because he got saved about a year after I did, and I said, are you serious? He said, yeah, he, he said, I, 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 gave that, I gave that to you, I, I, we said it was a loan, I never intended to give it back, he said, give it to the Lord, I'm like, this is cool, and I sat down, and, 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 uh, you know, I, I said, okay, we're gonna, I'm going to give this much to this church, and I'm going to give that much to this church, and I'm going to give this much to this ministry, and I'm going to give this much to, to that missionary. I don't think I've had so much fun in my life. I mean, I've, I mean up to that point, I was like, that was, that was, and I said, God, this is, this is great. This is fantastic. He said, yeah, you should try doing it with your money. <laughs> <laughs> And, and it was funny because it, it, it made sense as the, soon as the Lord said that. I, but but I, didn't have, I, I didn't appreciate how true it was. I mean, I knew it was true, but like degree, scope, scale. Because what was missing? You know, as I, as I sat down and, and allocated, you know, 3,000 plus interest, I think we just rounded it up to 5,000. You know, I mean, that, to be able to give away $5,000, that was a really big deal. But what was missing? I was giving anonymously like no one knew it was coming from me. But it wasn't costing me anything. <laughs> David said, I won't give to the Lord that which cost me nothing. Because without cost, there isn't love. Agape love is about others, but it's about others how? Sacrificially. I was giving with fondness, with affection, with brotherly love. That's storge, that's phileo. Agape love is sacrificial. Agape love costs. Agape love esteems others above myself at a cost. You want to meet someone who's truly joyful, who's, who's agape giving. Find someone who's not giving of their excess, of, of their spare, of, of what they can afford to give. Find someone who's not even asking that question, who's just seeing a need and meeting it and trusting that the Lord will provide. I came across a list of ways to give, and it's not perfect, but I think it's instructive. There's the careless giver. They don't really inquire, you know, who's running this charity? Is, where's this money going? You're asking, I'm giving. There's the impulsive giver, the person who, who is really easy to tug at their heartstrings. They give emotionally. They give through a, the, because of a tearful appeal. There's the lazy giver. Well, you know, let's, let's do a fundraiser. Let's do a bake sale. Let's, let's have a garage sale. It doesn't really cost me anything because you'll just get the proceeds of something that I never really had anyway. There's the systematic giver. Well, I'm just going to give a percentage you know, X percent of whatever I bring in. There's the self-denying giver. Well, I'm going to cut out a luxury. I'm, I'm going to cut out Netflix. And I'm going to cut out Hulu. I'm going to cut out Spotify. And I'm going to give that money to, to, to the poor or to the Lord. There's the equal giver. One for God, one for me. Two for God, two for me. And then there's the agape giver. How much do I really need to keep? Because everything else belongs to the Lord. Because when we do that, what do we remind ourselves of? Can't outgive God. Inexhaustible supply. Proverbs 19, verse 17. He who has pity on the poor lends to the Lord, and he, the Lord, will pay back what he has been given. Can not give God? Go to chapter 21, verse 13. We can not give God, but when we don't try, whoever shuts his ear to the cry of the poor will also cry himself and not be heard. Earlier in our study, we said what is usually, generally, often a prerequisite to getting more wisdom from God acting on the last wisdom we got from God, right? When, when, when we say, God, I don't, I don't know what I should do, and, and, and he's not answering that prayer, a good question to ask, have I done the last thing the Lord asked me to do? 
What's something that the Lord asked every one of us to do? Love the poor. And if you doubt that, even if you don't doubt it, turn to Matthew 25 for a moment. New Testament on a Wednesday. Blowing my mind. Yeah. I'm going to blow it more in a minute here. You ready to get sober? Matthew 25, go to verse 31. The sheep and goats judgment. Go to verse 34. The king will say to those on his right hand, Come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you took me in. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. The righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, thirsty and give you drink? When did we see you a stranger and take you in, or naked and clothe you? Or when did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? And the king will answer and say to them, Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. And then he'll also to say to those on the left, Depart from me, you cursed, into the everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no drink. I was thirsty, and you gave, I'm, uh, hungry, and you gave me no food. Thirsty, and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, you did not take me, and naked, and you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison, you did not visit me. And they'll answer him and say, Lord, when did we see you hungry, or thirsty, or a stranger, or naked, or sick and, and in prison, and didn't minister to you? And he'll answer to them, saying, Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into everlasting life. Okay, so, so, so giving to the poor is how we're saved? No, that's not what Jesus said. What is he, say, what is he saying? How we regard the poor... And the stranger and the hungry and the lonely is, is evidence that we're saved. You know, Sunday we talked about they'll know we're Christians by our love. And one manifestation of that love on Sunday was unity. Another manifestation of that love, generosity. But, but, but then they'll be rich and I'll be poor. And we haven't solved anything. We've just rearranged the deck chairs on the Titanic. Not a zero-sum game. Proverbs 22, verse 9. He who has a generous eye will be blessed, for he gives of his bread to the poor. Proverbs 28, verse 27. He who gives to the poor will not lack, but he who hides his eye will have many curses. Can't outgive God. But I've worked hard to get where I am. Rationalizations are coming louder and faster, aren't they? Your heart's fighting back. Mine too. We've said from the beginning, this is war. Spirit versus flesh. Selfishness versus sanctification. Loving and serving and giving in God versus keeping and guarding and protecting me. And here's another rationalization our flesh loves to try to stand on to justify selfishness. I deserve what I have. If the poor worked hard, they'd have what they deserve. American dream, right? Doesn't always work that way, though, does it? Go back to chapter 13 and look at verse 23. Much food is in the fallow ground of the poor, and for lack of justice, there's waste. Sometimes we work hard, and it still comes to nothing. Ask any farmer. The value of the crop, the size of the crop, is not always in proportion to the amount of work. Weather happens, disease happens, blight happens. Injustice happens in a fallen world been talking to Youth Horizons as they uh, continue to expand their ministry at the Boys Ranch and soon to be uh, also a girls' ranch, talking about ways we can be even more invested in that ministry, uh, have it even be more of an outreach for us. 
Youth Horizons, if you're not familiar with their ministry, they do mentoring here in town at the ranch. They serve currently young men who are in a world of trouble. <laughs> Many of them on, on, on their, their last shot before they, they, they face incarceration. Some of them have been through incarceration and, and this is their, their shot at transitioning out. Why are they in trouble? Well, bad choices. Why did they make bad choices, these, these boys, these young men? A lot of them because they didn't have fathers. You walk around the 20-some young men at the ranch, few if any of them grew up with a father or a father figure. Most of them grew up in poverty. Almost all of them victims of crimes themselves at an early age, often crimes perpetrated at the hands of family members, people who were supposed to love and protect them. Many of them got involved in substance abuse at a young age, invited into abuse, again, by family members. To look at the least and the last and the lost of our society and say, well, you know, it's their choice. I mean, that's to ignore the impact that other people's choices had at them at an early age. Does it absolve them of responsibility? No. Does it help us find our humanity? To have mercy? To love with agape? I hope it does. Chapter, verse, uh, chapter 14, verse 31, He who oppresses the poor reproaches his maker, but he who honors him has mercy on the needy. When we look at the poor, we need to try to see through God's eyes. What's God's perspective? It's always agape. And do we need to be prayerful as we love? Yes. Simply saying yes to every request is not love. Somebody gave me a book last year, When Helping Hurts, talking about how many of the, the church's efforts here in the United States as well as overseas actually end up doing damage to the people that with the best of intentions we're trying to serve. Careless giving, careless saying yes can actually reinforce a poverty cycle. One reason that our benevolence ministry here, when, we, when we're asked and we try to you know, set out and, and, and meet a need, we try to, on the one hand, with, with, with one hand, okay, what can we do to meet the acute need? What can we do to stop the bleeding? But what's the chronic underlying condition? Why is there bleeding? Can, can we look at a budget? Can we look at the employment situation? Can we look at the housing situation? So that we can be truly helpful. But what's the goal? What's the heart? Are we looking at the poor with contempt and saying, well, yeah, you made your choices. Because God just said, that's just, it, it's not just unkind and unloving to them. Chapter 14, verse 31, it's disrespectful to God. When we're faced with an opportunity to love anyone, but especially the poor, we have an opportunity to represent our maker, our savior, or to reject him, to hand him reproach. Long time ago in a previous gig, I was asked to mediate a dispute between labor and management. And I remember the feeling I had as Labor representatives were already in the room, and I was in the room, and two people from management walked into the room, and everyone in the room turned their back as, 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 as a token of their rejection, their contempt. And, and of course, we're seeing right now in, in professional sports athletes with an opportunity to honor our flag, honor our nation, honor people who have bled for our nation, kneeling or, 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 or doing things other than respecting it. That's the experience that God has when we look at the poor and, and broad brush everybody with, with the same coat of paint. It's all the same. They don't want to work. And God cares enough to look harder. 
God looks at the individual, and he asks us to as well. Proverbs 22, verse 16. He who presses the poor to increase his riches, and he who gives to the rich will surely come to poverty. Verse 22 of the same chapter, Do not rob the poor because he's poor, nor oppress the afflicted at the gate, for the Lord will plead their cause and plunder the soul of those who plunder them. Proverbs 29. Look at verse 7. The righteous considers the cause of the poor, but the wicked does not understand such knowledge. God cares. And some of you are thinking, Patrick, you're talking about the poor like there's someone else. (laughs) As if I'm rich and I'm in a position to do something about it. So a couple responses. Yeah, okay, yeah. (laughs) Here's here's the first thing we've got to remember. Compared to seven-eighths of the world population, everyone in the United States is rich. And that's just just true. But but set that aside for a moment. Because for those of us who are in Christ, we're richer still. We're joint heirs with Christ. Partakers of His inheritance. We are rich. And we're especially rich in the way that counts. Because what have you noticed God talking about side by side? As he's talking about wealth, what is God talking about side by side? As he's talking about riches, what concept keeps coming up? Heart. Because in in God's economy, those concepts are inexorably linked. Is our heart to keep or to give? The rest is up to him. Because if you notice, people who want to give, people who want to help, they always find a way. People who want to keep, people who want to fear, they always find a reason to. God doesn't need our money. God doesn't need our participation in his ministry. It's our privilege to sign on. It's our privilege to play a part. And if we want to, if it is our heart to, he'll make sure that we can. Another Paderewski story. Remember the Polish pianist? So at one point, he's traveling the world giving concerts to try to raise money for the cause of Polish independence. And as he's getting ready to perform one night, young boy in the front row with his parents, notices his parents are distracted. There's a big old piano on stage. He runs up there because he's been taking piano lessons. And right as Paduski walks out and is being introduced, the little boy jumps up onto the stool and he starts plinking out, twinkle, twinkle, little star. Well, the virtuoso comes up behind him and he suddenly realizes, okay, something is very, very wrong (laughs) But he says, no, keep going. Really? Yeah, keep going. And so the boy keeps with his two fingers planking out, twinkle, twinkle, little star. And he reaches around him and starts playing chords and arpeggios and improvisations and turns this simple little child's tune into this magnificent work of art. That's what God does. You know, to those who would say, what can I do my, my handful of, of, of dollars, my handful of coins, it's a drop in the bucket. God cares about the drop. All he wants is our drop. Filling the bucket, that's his problem. That's his blessing. God cares that we care. God wants us to share his heart As for our circumstances, chapter 15, verse 15. All the days of the afflicted are evil, but he who is of a merry heart has a continual feast. I can be wealthy and miserable, and I have been. I can be poor and joyful, and I have been. These things aren't contingent on circumstances. Joy 
Joy comes from our heart. And the nature of joy is to overflow. We, we, we hoard our happiness because we know how fleeting it is. We know how passing it is. Measure of a heart. The granite heart, you have to chip on it to even get a spark. The sponge heart, you have to squeeze it to get anything out of it. But when God talks about the honeycomb, what's true about honeycomb? It just oozes. You don't have to do anything to it. It just sits there and oozes. That's the heart that God would have for us, the heart that simply overflows because of the condition of the heart, because of the sweetness that we've allowed into our hearts, because of the decision that we've made to give over our hearts. Proverbs 29, our last verse for the evening. The poor man and the oppressor have this in common. The Lord gives light to the eyes of both. You know, whether you classify yourself as rich or poor or somewhere in between doesn't really matter. It doesn't matter nearly as much as whether you're a Christian or not, a believer or an unbeliever, because there is no in between. If you're a believer, you're a child of God, and God cares for you. And He has a plan for you, and a ministry for you, and resources that He's entrusted to you. And the focus of that ministry, the way that you'll know that it is ministry, is that it doesn't benefit you. Love others, Jesus says, especially the ones who can't love you back. That's how you know that it's pure. That's how you know it's not self-service in disguise. God says, love the people who can't love you back. Let me use you to provide for them. And trust me that I'll provide for you. Lord, a lot to think about this evening. A lot that challenges us. Guard our hearts, Lord, against condemnation. Because that quickly becomes an excuse to do nothing. Because I'm not worthy, I can't serve the Lord, I shouldn't even try. And then there we are focused on ourselves again. Lord, you've called us to more than that. You've called us to better than that. In your spirit we are so much greater than that. So let let the conviction of your word sting, Lord. Let your word have its perfect work. Point us to truth. Reveal our pride. But also, Lord, remind us through your grace to trust you. Especially in the ways that we haven't yet. The ways that maybe we used to and haven't for a while. Lord, you call us to simple dependency. May we find that in you. In Jesus' name.